you create the world of the dream. How could I ever acquire enough detail to make them think that it's reality? Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? Let me ask you a question. You, you never really remember the beginning of a dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. I guess, yeah. So how did we end up here? Well, we just came from the, uh... Think about it, Ariadne. How did you get here? Where are you right now? That's from Inception, a movie that explores a lot of the topics we're going to be talking about today in terms of dreaming, lucid dreaming, the extended consciousness realms of dreaming, and what those might mean for how we could engineer or explore those with various kinds of technology. Our guest today is lucid dream expert Charlie Morley, and I'm also joined by Richard Cox from Deep State Consciousness Podcast. Here's a clip. When he was watching one of these people in the lucid dream, trying to prove lucid dreaming, at one point he saw their eyes flicking left, right, left, right, really kind of synchronous. And he woke them up and said, what were you dreaming about? And they said, oh, oh, I would dream about a tennis match. And he was like, oh, that's cool. So he made the first discovery. The eyes physically correspond to what you're dreaming about. So then he thought, okay, right. So maybe I can send a signal, a kind of a Morse code signal from the lucid dream state to the waking state saying, hey guys, I'm in here, I'm, I'm doing the test, I'm, I'm doing the experiment. And he managed to do that. And I said, so how did it work? And he said, oh, I'd spent eight hours looking at this. He said, suddenly on the, on the uh, paper, it went, dum, 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 dum. And I said to him, like, how did it feel when you saw those eye movements come through? He went, Charlie, in those movies, uh, when they're in the NASA control room and they finally get the, the, uh, the thing from Mars and they all give each other high fives. I said, yeah, and he went, it was like that, but I had no one to high five. And I kind of leant over and gave him that we like actually missed. We had this like awkward missed high five. Uh, and he went, oh, well, 40 years too late, but thank you. <laughs> I wanted to say about entities because I realized I gave you the Jungian view on entities. I gave you the Buddhist view on entities. I didn't actually give you my personal view on entities, which is like, yeah, man, anyone who's had like a DMT experience or like moving into kind of psilocybin therapy or, or ayahuasca or something, these are, these are not internally generated experiences. Like when people are all having the same experience of mother ayahuasca coming over them and she appears in the same way and often is offering the same guidance, you're thinking, this is existing, dude. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris. And today we welcome Charlie Morley to Skeptico. Charlie is a lucid dreaming expert, having authored several best-selling books on the topic and conducted, I don't know at this point, probably, I'm sure, Charlie, hundreds of workshops around the world in which he helps people develop this skill and then apply it to their life. And Charlie, as we're going to find out, is also one of those really interesting guys who has integrated kind of the best of Western understandings of not just spirituality, but maybe this science, we could say. He has the bona fides in terms of studying Tibetan Buddhism and really immersing himself in it. He's a terrific public speaker. He has a great TED Talk out there, which we'll also kind of want to talk about. So it's great to have him here on Skeptical. I think he's going to be really good. And we also have Riding Shotgun, but we'll probably drag him into this conversation as well, Richard Cox from the Deep State Consciousness Podcast. I was just explaining to Charlie that that's how I ran across Charlie's work, which is really terrific on lucid dreaming. And then Richard's been helping me with this new book, Why Evil Matters. And I said, hey, man, all this stuff that Charlie is talking about is directly syncing up with all these things I'm hearing from people of these other traditions. Of course, that's the way it's supposed to work. So... I wanted to talk with Charlie and, and I just invited uh, Richard along because I'm sure he'll have some interesting insights as well. So Charlie and Richard, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Alex. So I gave people kind of a thumbnail sketch of the background. Charlie, please tell us more about who you are and how you came to this work. Yeah, so I started teaching lucid dreaming about 11 years ago. I'd been into it for a lot longer. I started lucid dreaming in my teens, so like when I was 16, 17, so about 20 years ago. 
And yeah, it was just something I, I got into. I read some books, geeked out about it, was into it in my teens because it seemed like a really cool way to like get access to this virtual reality simulation of your own psychology where you could do whatever you wanted. So at 16, 17, all I want to do is have loads of sex. So the first like two years of my lucid dream experience, a lucid dream for those who, who are wondering is the uh, dream way that you're dreaming as you're dreaming and then you can direct the dream at will. So at 16, I knew what I wanted to direct it to do, right? I was like, hot girls come to me and then all these hot girls would appear. I'd have all this great sex that I wasn't having in real life because I was like 16, right? And skateboarding, <laughs> I did a lot of skateboarding. And weirdly, since then, in the last 10 years, there's been a, a whole wealth of studies showing that you can get better at sports by practicing and lucid dreaming. And I got really good at skateboarding. So maybe it was down to those neural pathways firing off the other thing. Not so, I didn't get very good at that, but still had lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was kind of messing about with lucid dreaming for those first couple of years. And then I get into Buddhism when I'm about 18, 19, read a couple of books by the Dalai Lama, I had a big kind of near-death experience. I got into like drugs and psychedelics and had a near-death experience from that. That then made me look not just at Buddhism, but specifically Tibetan Buddhism. And then I found out that not only are they into death, but they're into dreams. And they have this thing called dream yoga, which is like this whole collection of practices which have lucid dream training at their base which use the lucid dream state to explore the nature of reality, to prepare for death and dying, and to do your spiritual practice in your sleep. So I was like, wow, okay, these, these dudes sound cool. So I started hanging out with these, well, hanging out, taking teachings from these lamas and teachers, and then I ended up living in a Buddhist center for like eight years, which was kind of a quite immersive experience. And then, yeah, got asked by my Buddhist teacher when I was 25 to start giving workshops and stuff. And yeah, then wrote some books about it and been running workshops and retreats ever since. So you have some terrific books out there. And I want to let people know, these books are from a major publisher, Hay House, and you have some recordings out there as well. They're really super accessible, like price wise, they're accessible. You can get some of these books for oh, cool. nothing or Kindle Unlimited. Yeah, at the moment, just... they're on some crazy lockdown sale. They're like 99 cents or something on, Audible, on, uh, on Kindle. Yeah, I'm telling you, folks, go and grab this stuff, scoop it up. And then also check out Charlie's TED Talk recorded here in my hometown of San Diego oh, a few years ago, but just great stuff. What I'm hoping we can do is direct folks to go do that and then find out about this guy. If you have any interest at all in developing this skill, he offers workshops and now with the social distancing thing, a lot of online one-on-one -on -one coaching, yeah. all that is available. So with that, I guess I'm asking for permission to kind of jump past maybe some of that and get into some of the deeper philosophical stuff that you guys talked about, that you and Richard talked about. Mm -hmm. And in particular, some of these parallels in terms of what this stuff really means. I love the way you start off and talk about the realness of, hey, if you can lose a dream, why can't I do that? Why can't I go have sex? Or the other thing, why can't I go around and do things or spy and be all these things that people do or flying and all that stuff. Mm. And I, I think that immediately, once you get past that, just like you said, it launches us into a bunch of deeper questions about the nature of reality, about the nature of evil, which is something you explore in your book. One of the books I had up there on the on the website is Dreaming Through Darkness, which is something oh, yeah. I guess we could talk about. So yeah. with your permission, let's kind of jump into the deep waters of what this stuff really is telling us about the larger nature of reality, and in particular, what it's telling us about darkness, evil, shadow. I guess we have to start by defining what those mean to you. Mm. Yeah, so okay, well, let's look at that term, the shadow, which is what the, my latest book, Dreaming Through Darkness, is about. So Carl Jung popularized the term shadow. Of course, he didn't invent the concept. The concept of a shadow side to, to the psyche, to the soul, to the mind has been around since, since humans started talking about this stuff, or writing about this stuff at least. But Carl Jung defined the shadow as the parts of the unconscious mind that we have rejected, denied, or disowned. He described it as the dark side of the human psyche. But crucial, and this is the crucial bit, the dark side of the human psyche, comma, but not dark meaning bad, evil, or malign, dark meaning yet to be illuminated. And that's crucial to understand here. The shadow is not bad. It's not some sort of untapped source of evil or harm. It's simply that which we hide from ourselves and others. 
So if we think, what do we hide from ourselves and others? Okay, that may well contain aspects which are harmful for ourselves and others. We might hide our, our greed, our hatred, our prejudice, our racism, our internet search history, whatever. You, we hide this stuff from others, our shame, our fear. But there's also an aspect called the golden shadow. I mean, Jung never, called, never referred to this concept, the golden shadow, but there's a famous quote from his teachings where he says, the shadow is 90% pure gold. And from that, the post-Jungians took this idea of the golden shadow. And the golden shadow is actually exactly the same definition, that which we repress, deny, or disown. But it's the parts we repress, deny, and disown, which are more overtly beneficial. For example, our hidden talents, uh, our sexuality, our spiritual side. I mean, there may well be your listeners listening now. Um, I would ask them this question. Do you ever hide your esoteric side from your friends or family for fear of being labeled too woo-woo? If the answer is yes, that's golden shadow. Your spiritual side, something that couldn't be more, more healthy if you tried. The aspect of yourself that wants to grow, that wants to explore your psycho-spiritual growth, and yet we hide it from others. Why? Exactly the same reason we hide the dark shadow, fear of rejection from the tribe, which back in the day was tantamount to uh, the death, this, this uh, kind of rejection trauma that we have, this transhumanistic rejection trauma that permeates all of our minds plays out when we hide our shadow, our golden shadow from others. And even the dark shadow isn't necessarily bad. It's just parts of us which are repressed. But if we can be aware of the shadow, what we don't know about controls us. So by being aware of the shadow, simply by knowing that it exists, by, by learning about our personal shadow, we remove a lot of the control that, that unconscious um, shadow material has over us. So shadow work is inherently healthy. It's a good thing to do. And Jung, another kind of famous thing he said was those who claim to have no shadow are the most dangerous people on earth because they're the well, people without this awareness, right? Well, see, now that, that creeps into some different territory, though, doesn't it? Which in, in kind of classic Jungian fashion, where you're kind of marching along with him, and then he says something like that, and we go, well, what the <laughs> hell would that mean? What would we have to fear and it would be dangerous unless there's something external beyond the shadow. And I think that plays into something that I did want to get into. And it comes up in your TED talk, and it, it invariably comes up whenever we talk about these topics. And that is the integration between the Western understanding of consciousness and the obviously limited understanding, which we have to dance around. So I get it. You're up there doing a TED talk, and I've talked to a bunch of people, Caltech, physicist who says, yeah, I got up there to do the TED talk and they coached me beforehand. Kind of don't go into this. We don't like this. We love everything you say. Just can you kind of say it kind of like this? Yeah. They and at one it. point in your TED talk, you go and up here as if this stuff is in our brain physically. Mm -hmm. I know you probably don't think that's true. Scientifically, <laughs> it isn't true. Buddhist wise, we know it's we're past that, but we have yeah. to kind of play that play that game. And in the same way, Jung is kind of playing that game and that it's all our shadow, it's our internal work, but there's some dangerous shit out there if you go outside of it as well. So do you want to speak to that at all in terms of how we navigate that in the scientific community and then how we navigate this evil as it maybe is existing in an external form? Yes. I mean, straight off the bat, I don't believe in any objectively existing external evil. I don't even believe in evil as a concept. I believe in traumatized people acting out unintegrated trauma, which manifests as seeming human evil. But as far as like an objectively existing evil or kind of satanic archetype, yeah, I don't really believe in that. I believe that there is probably in the collective unconscious an archetypal energy of Satan because so many people have believed and projected this belief out of the collective that, that this thing exists, that it probably does. Just as so many as enough people have believed that there's a God concept, that that probably exists too. But because something seems to exist doesn't mean that it's real. But then what is real here? It's, it's something can be real and not true. It's like the Buddhist ideas of these like six realms of existence, but I talked to Richard about these hell realms. And they have all the descriptions of these like hell, like 16 hell realms. But actually if you, and they've each got descriptions of how they feel and stuff. But if you look at them, they're all psychological correlates. They're descriptions of depression. I mean, one of the brilliant, the hell realm says, you have molten lead poured through your mouth till your limbs are too heavy to move. Now, anyone who's been in that deep depression of grief when you've lost someone you love, 
and you're in bed and you're you literally your arms are so heavy with the pressure and you can't even move them that's the hell realm you're in that hell realm or the hell realm of trauma or the hell realm of anger these aren't kind of places objectively existing they're shades of suffering which we can experience in the mind but then as a caveat to that they also say the hell realms don't exist out there but then neither does this this waking life so from a buddhist point of view the hell realms are as real as this waking life but are also as unreal as this waking life and then i get way out of my depth now <laughs> then you need to speak to some buddhist lama or something i don't think you know i can understand what they're getting at there but i don't fucking know man. I'm, I'm trying right to a certain extent, that's the dilemma, because this is where we all live. We all live in this reality, and whether it's a constructed reality or not, this is where we reside, and this is where we have to kind of try and navigate, whether it's mm-hmm. taking, taking lucid dreaming classes to further our spiritual development, whatever the hell that would mean, or whether it means saying the making the sign of the cross over your chest or burning sage in your room to clear out spirits. All these things are part of our reality that I guess I'm trying to, if not kind of wrestle to the ground to at least draw attention to the fact that there are enough people from different traditions talking about these, that we maybe ought to at least look at the extent to which science has completely abdicated its responsibility for exploring this. So we do not have a scientific understanding of where we would even begin to talk about what evil is because science can't even talk about extended consciousness. So I'm always keen to finding people who are talking about the way that you're talking about it is great. So let me do this. Let me juxtapose what you're saying with a guest that I just had on the show who I think is really a pretty interesting guy. And I think they'll offer a a springboard into talking about a lot of this stuff. This guy's name is Tom Zinzer. Mm -hmm. And Tom is a clinical psychologist. He's been a clinical psychologist for like 30 years, thousands of patients. And he got into doing some of this spirit work, some of this darkness work with his clients in the form of ego separation. I think it has direct parallels to what you're talking about. Let's listen to what he has to say. Distinction that you make between darkness and evil. Well, I have to go back again and emphasize the clinical nature because all of these start with the client's own story. My work is basically identifying those things within a person that blocks the light. So the protocol developed for the ego stasis, make the contact, communicate with them, make it safe for them to receive this light love energy. Once they receive it, as I said, 99% say, whippy, uh, I love this, I don't want to be without it. And then they will move through the sharing and release of what happened to them. For spirit attachment, outside entities, it's a different protocol. They don't belong with the person. They need to leave. And in the worst cases, protocols designed to get to a point where they could be removed. Okay, so, so here's the point. And so Jung is also a clinician, right? It's interesting to look at that history. He's meeting with people. And at one point, I think Jung says, whether these spirit entities are real or not, I've found it most effective to assume and act as if they are. Mm. And now I think what Tom is saying from as a clinician, here's a guy who reached a point in his practice where he was ready to give up his hypnotherapy work because people weren't getting better. But when he connected with the spirit guide who said, here's how you have to work with these people. And they really do in some cases have spirit possession or, or spirit interference. And that that's really what's going on, that these people started getting better in a lot more ways. So mm-hmm. again, I, I, I'd kind of throw it out there, Charlie, where do we kind of get into that blurry zone of what is real real and what is real in terms of this creation that we have in this plane of existence? Yeah, great question. I mean, if you look at some of the research on like exorcisms, they work really well. 
if the client believes that they have a spirit within them, and if you do like an exorcism and you really go for it and you enter into that, what I would say, entering into the, into the psychosis of the client, then the exorcism could work, right? It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that there was an externally existing objective entity there in the first place, though. I mean, I've does, it mean there, does it mean there wasn't an external spirit? Yeah, I don't think it matters if there was. I think if it is like an internal psychosis, it's manifesting as some, I mean, if an element of the shadow becomes so split off, it will kind of take on its own consciousness. I mean, Jung was saying this, right? And that will seem like an external entity. Just like in your lucid dream, you can meet the shadow. And it will, people say, no, no, that wasn't my shadow. That was an external demon that entered. And I say, that's the calling card of the shadow. It, will, it won't seem like it's part of you. That's the point, because it has been split off. So again, you kind of loop around here. And well, where do we go here? I mean, the Buddhist point of view is, if you look at the Buddhist view on demons, right? I love this stuff. Um, Macha Glabdrin, who's a famous female uh, practitioner of the 10th century, she was called the M uh, mistress of demons. And she's asked by her son, mother, what is this demon that you talk of? He says, oh, my son, when I talk of demons, I do not mean some small black creature who terrifies all who look upon it. When I talk of demons, I talk of anything that prevents your experience of freedom. I think, wow. So when we use the term like the demon of my addiction, the demon of my grief, the demon of my hatred, we're kind of using Buddhist terminology there very correctly. It's not that it's an external entity. It's anything within us that prevents our experience of freedom. And yet, if you look at the practice for exercising those demons within us in Buddhism, it is a very dualistic practice where you allow that demon of an addiction, perhaps, to be personified. And you imagine offering yourself to that demon. Um, actually, gets very kind of esoteric. Then you offer parts of your body and stuff. You kind of dine with demons. You, you break bread with the enemy, as it were. So there's a, there is this external personification of the demon, but simply as a way for you to interact with it in dialogue. At no point is it ever said we should believe those demons actually exist. And again, you look at like Milarepa, one of the most famous saints. Again, he says, there are no demons. There is only the demon that prevents freedom existing in one's mind. So the Buddhist view, this kind of non-dualistic view is there is no, that there are no external demons. But it can be a very good idea sometimes to externalize or personify an element of our own trauma so that we can dialogue with it. And that's why chair therapy works so well. That's why the feeding your demons practice of Sultra Malioni works so well. That's why this chuk practice within Tibetan Buddhism seems to work so well. But the view is there isn't any external entity there. Oh, but one more thing that that guy said that was, was really cool, where he talked about what was blocking the light. And I love this idea with shadow work, both in the, the Buddhist view of shadow work, although you can't really say that because there isn't a concept of the shadow in Buddhism, but the Buddhist view of working with harmful, possibly harmful energies within us. A shadow is an epiphenomena caused by an object blocking the light. So we've got a source of light, we've got an object blocking the light, and then we have a shadow. And that shadow will often be in the shape of the object that is blocking the light. So with shadow work, we're looking at the shadow, but we can sometimes get so tied up in the shape of the shadow, we forget that it's not about the shadow, it's about the thing blocking the light. So the most important thing to do is to see the shadow, see the shape, and with that say, oh, that shape of the shadow looks a bit light. So then I can start looking for those blocks within my psychophysical system. Remove the block and there's no shadow, there's only light. So again, it's not that the shadow was something, it was form emptiness. It was something unreal appearing in form, but it never truly existed. It was simply an epiphenomena caused by something blocking the light. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but... Well, it, 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 it makes sense. I just don't know if it stands up to the different data that we see out there. So I'm totally okay with what you're saying. I'm more than okay with what you're saying. I'm glad well, you're bringing okay, it forward. Let's look at data then, because I'll tell you this. Well, let me make sure yeah, we're looking sure. at the same data. I'd throw some data on the table. So I'd throw, mm -hmm. first of all, there's a guy in at the University of Arizona, Gary Schwartz, super PhD, head of the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry at Harvard and Yale and all these places. One of the work that he did, and we've all heard about this work, we just don't know the source of it, is a guy goes out, he gets a heart transplant, and before it, he was vegan, super healthy, and he comes out of it, and now he likes pizza and drinking beer and watching sports. Mm -hmm. And it turns out they go and meet the donor, and that's what he liked to do. Mm -hmm. And then we go to University of Virginia, and we do, Ian Stevenson's was famous for pioneering this work on uh, reincarnation. And they go and they have all this very well carefully done 
uh, research where they go and they track down these people and the reincarnation data fits and there's no way of knowing it. Again, suggesting that there is an extended consciousness entity that is real and has the ability to influence, enter into, in a way not much different than a spirit possession, enter into people's real consciousness, whatever that is, and mm. affect it. So what about that data? So Alex, I would agree with everything you said there, apart from one word, which is entity. You said consciousness entity that can enter into. I would just remove that term. The, the Buddhist uh, view of mind is, is mind stream, which is brilliant. Mind stream is a non-personal, continually flowing stream of our, our kind of consciousness. In fact, beyond consciousness, because consciousness requires a self to be conscious of. But the, so this, that's the term, actually. That's how you translate it, mind stream. And the mind stream manifests into personalities in different incarnations. And the reincarnation data, I mean, it's amazing. Some of the stuff that Alan Wallace is bringing out, who is a, uh, again, done, does a lot of the uh, Mind Life Institute stuff. They bring the scientists talking to Dalai Lama and stuff. It's totally valid data, kind of proving in many cases, or seemingly to prove elements of reincarnation. So I'm totally down with that. But we can believe in reincarnation. We can believe in consciousness from somebody's heart being kind of imprinted and entering into another one. Absolutely. But... I don't see how that links to externally existing evil entities. Well, I don't understand the distinction. At, at, to a certain point, we get to a matter of semantics. If we say there's this consciousness stream that can break off and enter into this other individual and become part of their consciousness stream. And that's what I like about- But it's non-personal. Uh, entity, by definition, would be a, a personal, a kind of objective entity, right? Maybe, maybe not. Again, words, words get in the way. And all we're talking about, I mean, all I'm advocating for here is more serious discussions about this topic, the kind that we're having here. I don't yeah, have I mean, any firm brilliant. fixed like, beliefs. Me. But <laughs> me too. But here's like, what how Tom Zinzer. To have this conversation, right? Here's what Tom Zinzer was his takeaway from his clinical work. And again, this is really strange for a lot of people. But, but to give you a little bit more background on Tom's story, is again, he's got this practice, like he's a people helper and people come in, they're doing clinical work, they're sitting on the couch, I have this fear of spiders, I have this debilitating fear of going outside and Tom works with them through traditional hypnotherapy. And one day he's in the coffee room, the break room, and this woman walks up to him and says, I can't help but tell you that I overheard your conversation about out of body travel and Robert Monroe, and I've been talking to this spirit entity. And what, this spirit entity wants to talk to you. And he says, hey, fine, I'm game. I can handle it. I'm a PhD in psychology. I know where to draw the line. I have discernment. He starts communicating with Jared, the spirit, spirit entity, and pretty quickly he's off reservation in psychology, and he's taking Jared's insights, and he's integrating them hand in glove with all his practice and training in terms of clinical therapy. And Jared is saying, Oh, this person has a problem with a past life that may be getting in the way. Oh, this mm -hmm. person has an entity that has entered them that is their mother, and their mother needs to move on to the light. And then Tom, as you heard in, at the end, he's actually developed a protocol. And the protocol is a pre-scientific protocol, but it's bordering li borderline scientific, where he says, here's how we bring in the light, and we ask these entities to release into the light and there is this stage of confusion where they're at and da 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 and then he said that other part where and then some entities have no interest in going into the light so this is kind of stands a little bit in contrast to what you're saying i'm not saying he's right or he's wrong but i'm saying i think we have to fully consider the possibility that in this realm that we're in things do work in a way that that is best understood as these entities being real. And I'd throw that on the table and say, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's gonna sound like I've got a, well, I'm not contradicting myself, but also the Buddhist view is that this is not the only realm of existence. There are like six realms of existence, which can actually be all contacted through the human realm if you had to do it. And these include like hell beings, heaven realms, um, hungry ghost realms, of course, animal realm and the animal realm and the human realm are the only kind of ones that we can see with, with these eyes in this kind of spectrum that we, we see. But had we the eyes to see it, we could see these other beings, right? And if some people do, so if they have psychic capacity, 
or perhaps the use of psychedelics that opens up our kind of sphere of vision a little bit, then it seems like we can communicate with these. But again, this idea of kind of, these aren't entities, these are beings. These are like sentient beings. So it's not that they're, it's not like an entity, like a spirit, that these things are as real as humans. So from that point of view, God, we're absolutely not alone. There are, there are trillions because apparently humans are like the rarest. We're the rarest of these beings. There are way more hungry ghost beings and hell beings and all this kind of stuff. But these are sentient beings, not entities. They're not kind of, they're not other things. They're not spirits. They're real. But they're as real as we are. We just can't see them. Charlie, let me digress here for a second, because one of the things you said in the, in the TED Talk kind of blew me away and was almost like a throwaway point for you because you're so immersed in lucid dreaming and uh, in helping people develop that skill and use that skill in their life. But you said lucid dreaming is something that Western science has only acknowledged for the last 40 years, but Buddhist tradition, Buddhist wisdom has talked about extensively for a thousand years. So do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I can draw on the wisdom, but I don't know a lot of it. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm like kindergarten level as far as Buddhism goes. And that's someone who lived in a Buddhist center for eight years. And I still say I'm at absolutely kindergarten level. But yeah, I mean, there is a huge wealth of wisdom. If you look at kind of Western psychology, it began about a hundred years ago. Eastern psychology began about two and a half thousand years ago. It's, it's like the, the kind of mind mapping that these Eastern traditions have done, like 85,000 different aspects of mind that they've mapped, labeled, and showed how you can experience, makes a lot of kind of Western psychology seem to use the term I just did, kind of kindergarten level. And yet what it doesn't have is the amazing strides in neuroscience that we've had in the West. And what's really exciting at the moment is neuroscientists working with this ancient two and a half thousand year old psychological system and kind of proving each other. And that's where it gets really cool because I wasn't brought up a Buddhist. I kind of worship at the shrine of materialistic science as, as much as the next Westerner, whether we know we're doing it or not. This is the kind of religion we grow up in, right? So I'm always really excited when you get kind of brain stuff proving the Buddhist stuff. Not that we should need proof, but it's kind of cool when it does. So with lucid dreaming, when in the 70s, they first proved lucid dreaming, which apparently when I spoke to the guy who proved it, this doctor called uh, Keaton, I said, well, what was, what was the kind of equivalent of you proving it? He said, it would be kind of like us proving telekinesis right now, where there are some people who say they can do it. There's actually a lot of evidence that it could be possible, but it's still completely out there woo-woo. He said it was like that. It was like we proved telekinesis. And it had that same effect on the scientific community. It took about 10 years, even though it'd been proved in 1975, it took another 10 years before anyone was taking it seriously because it was just, no one would touch it, right? Then you had Stephen LaBerge a few years later over at Stanford who did similar tests and uh, he managed to get some stuff peer reviewed and, and published and stuff. You were probably much more familiar with that research, but I think it helps ground people. And I love the way you said it because we have this, we're swimming in this pool of Western rationalism in a way that we don't even understand we are, but we are. So I yeah. think it helps when we lock down what this science is like. So they're doing sleep science, right? So they're hooking people up to EEGs and they're looking at their eye movement and they're doing all the stuff that you would expect in order to understand this right it's it's real science if you will yeah i mean like back in the day the way they had to prove it in the mid 70s was or, or the kind of challenge the gauntlet that was laid down was the only way you can prove lucid dreaming is real is to send a signal from the lucid dream state to the waking state saying hey i'm conscious in here i mean that's a ridiculous gauntlet to lay down most people would have, would have given up right but this guy keith Helm was like okay i know it's real we've got all these testimonials from tibetan buddhism sufism toltec mexica even some of the early mystic uh, gnostic christian traditions so we know this is real right so we've got to send a signal so he started trying to send signals through the pinky because like the body is paralyzed during rem sleep so you can't really move but you can sometimes get little muscle twitches so first thing he, did was he tried to get his subject to go into a lucid dream hook him up to the brain scanners to show they are in a lucid dream and that the eyes are moving rapidly for rapid eye movement, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the pinky thing didn't work. But when he was watching one of these people in the lucid dream, trying to prove lucid dreaming, at one point he saw their eyes flicking left, right, left, right, really kind of synchronous. And he woke them up and said, what were you dreaming about? And they said, oh, oh, I would dream about a tennis match. And he was like, oh, that's cool. So he made the first discovery. The eyes physically correspond to what you're dreaming about. So then he thought, okay, right. 
So maybe I can send a signal, a kind of a Morse code signal from the lucid dream state to the waking state saying, hey guys, I'm in here, I'm, I'm doing the test, I'm, I'm doing the experiment. And he managed to do that. And I, I interviewed him actually at the Science Museum in London where they got the dream machine, the original kind of EEG thing he used to prove it. It's behind a kind of cabinet thing. I thought, cool place to interview him. And I said, so how did it work? And he said, oh, I'd spent eight hours looking at this. It was on, done on paper back then, paper readout, kind of like a lie detector test, right? Of the ink going tick, 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 tick across the screen of all these like random eye movements. And after about eight hours, he said, suddenly on the, on the uh, paper, it went, tum, 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 tum. Dum, 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 which was the kind of uh, Morse code thing, the eye movement. He said two, two to the left, one right, one to the left when you're dreaming. And it turns out the lucid dreamer he had hooked up to the, to the scanners had become lucid, had remembered the task. He had, oh, right, I've got to send the signal to the outside world. So in the lucid dream, he looked left, left, right, left. That was picked up on the eye monitors, thus proving a signal could be sent from that world. And I said to him, like, how did it feel when you saw those eye movements come through? And he's really sweet. He went, Charlie, when those movies, uh, when they're in the NASA control room and they finally get the, the, uh, the thing from Mars and they all give each other high fives. I said, yeah, and he went, it was like that, but I had no one to high five. And I kind of leant over and gave him that we like, actually missed. We had this like, awkward missed high five. Uh, and he went, oh, well, 40 years too late, but thank you. <laughs> I was like, oh, dude, he'd be waiting for that high five for so long. But anyway, so they proved it in the 70s. So it was real stuff. Um, but then slightly more contemporarily in, I think, like 2010, they did the first fMRI scan on a lucid dreamer. Now, I've been in an fMRI scanner before when they wanted to see if I'd changed my brain through meditation. I'm sure I had no changes, but they wanted to check. And it's like a techno rave. When they put on the magnet that goes around, it goes, dum, 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 rucka, ducka, dum. I was like, how the hell could anyone sleep in this, let alone meditate? But anyway, this guy in Germany managed to fall asleep in one of these things, have a lucid dream, and they got live footage of what happens to the brain when you become lucid. And they had theorized that when you become lucid in a dream, the senses to do with self-perception and self-reflective awareness, so I know that I'm having experience, would light up. And they were proved exactly right. The right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex just lights up like a Christmas tree as soon as this guy gets lucid. Um, and they all got that. And then suddenly, once they had that, all this funding came through. And now all these cool lucid dream research things. And one of the cool things they did after that was on sports. They wanted to see, they were like, oh, wait, once you get lucid, your brain doesn't think you're dreaming. It thinks you're awake. So we wonder, would the brain lay down neural pathways in the same way as it does when we're awake? Wouldn't that be cool? They were like, yeah, and they proved it. They get people to go in their lucid dream and practice athletic disciplines, like doing squats or press ups, stuff like this, and control conditions, obviously. The next day they check them, essentially, they got better at doing squats, better at doing press ups. They improved their physical sporting performance by training in the lucid dream because of these neural pathways, neural networks being stimulated while they sleep. If this sounds like sci-fi, it kind of should. I mean, this is nuts, but this is science now. I wanted to say about entities because I realized I gave you the Jungian view on entities. I gave you the Buddhist view on entities. I didn't actually give you my personal view on entities, which is like, yeah, man, anyone who's had like a DMT experience or like moving into kind of psilocybin therapy or, or ayahuasca or something, these are, these are not internally generated experiences like when people are all having the same experience of mother ayahuasca coming over to them and she appears in the same way and often is offering the same guidance you're thinking this is existing dude and rick strassman does a clinical work with dmt and the patients yeah. don't know each other and they say did you see the purple jaguar yeah, yeah. i saw the purple jaguar oh, too i got a bit lost in the language on that part when you were saying about entities don't exist but like disincarnate granny might exist or beings might exist like and how, how are you defining entities because i totally it seems to be the nature of consciousness to disassociate right and i think there's like there's two biases that can go on here so people who are very much into mediumistic stuff and um, can maybe miss that about consciousness and when i've interviewed people who who work with like, hearing voices and listen to their accounts it, it does seem to be like you say, the traumatized parts of ourselves can separate off and start to act as seemingly independently. And anyone who's ever had a dream just knows that's the case. Like we talk about it as if it's really far out thing, like, like voices in my head, but like, yeah, we're just fall asleep and you have voices in your head yeah. that seem totally separate from you. So that seems to be like the nature of, of consciousness. And at the same time, I think people looking from that perspective can miss the point that sometimes these voices deliver information that, the recipient has no earthly right to have and i've met i've had experiences that myself and i've met like way 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 too many people who have had it 
there's also research in, in labs like Gary Swartz and Julie Byshell and so on. So that's what I'm, when I'm thinking like the word entity, I'm thinking of like uh, the entity could be like granny from the astral plane, or it could be a pirate from the 17th century on the astral plane or something else. But are, are you using the word entity differently there? Or would you disagree with anything I've just said that there seems to be a, like as best I can see a coexistence of two different phenomena that might be reducible to one phenomenon at some higher level, but on the level we're kind of looking at here, it seems to be like there are two categories of things that overlap. It's just funny that term entity is often used to, it's like kind of spirit possession and entities and, and kind of these things that attach to us. And the Buddhist view on it is actually these are sentient beings. These aren't kind of entities, almost like entities, almost like a little bit of a, a, a pejorative term here. And actually, it's not that they're beings. They're, they're sentient beings, as sentient as you and I, but they're existing in different dimensions of reality. It's not that there's like an objective entity kind of clinging onto us in this reality that perhaps that we're experiencing like an interdimensional communication with these other beings in other realities. But again, I mean, I get out of my depth very quickly with this because as Buddha said, like, take nothing I tell you is true till you find it's true yourself. So like... I can talk about the Buddhist view on things, but really like my own view is that I'm yet to find any proof of external entities entering people's lucid dreams or anything like that. However, in the outer body state, I have a lot of proof that you can absolutely contact things which are not you. But this is because you have left the, the scope of your own personal consciousness and are now in a space where you can absolutely meet beings just like I can meet you. But because you're in a disembodied form, your kind of spectrum of who you can meet is much, much wider. Let me, let me take a run at this in a slightly different way because you're being super humble because you sound like a super humble, cool, spiritually enlightened guy, but you have a lot to offer and you, you've done a lot of this work and you've also worked with so many people. So you have the kind of advantage of having that kind of collective experience of so many people who you've taken through this. Let me try and see if I can lay out another parallel that I've found between you and what Tom Zinzer is saying, and then we're going to look at one other person I've talked to who is a medium there in the UK, Claire Broad, and both Richard and I have both spoken to her, and she has a different perspective on this as well. But at some point, Charlie, I heard you say that it is understood through the Buddhist tradition, our ability to create the separation in these ego states can lead to those states actually becoming real in some sense. And I might not be saying that exactly the way that you said it, but that was the gist. I don't think I totally understand that question. Yeah, so maybe I'm not getting it. I'll tell you what Tom Zinzer says. Yeah. So Tom Zinzer, like when he first started doing this work, he was working with people that had disassociative identity disorder, right? Split personality kind of stuff, which, 20, 30 years ago was like highly controversial and now it's accepted. People have all sorts of disassociation with parts of themselves and sometimes it's very mild and it just causes anxiety that seems to come out of nowhere. And sometimes it's like really extreme where people can forget the other part of themselves while they're occupying this other space. And I thought I heard either, and if I didn't, we'll just scratch all this, but I thought I heard either in your TED talk or your interview with Richard, you talking about that the Buddhists understood that you could, if you kind of put your energy into it, break off a side of a break off a part of yourself in that consciousness space that we all have, and that that can become, and in your lucid dreams, you can dream in that, and that you can kind of, and it kind of becomes this tulpa thing where it kind of actually becomes real in oh, the same way that. Tulpas, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, Tulpas Tulp <laughs> gets into very, very esoteric. And it's esoteric, but isn't it also just kind of a, an ordinary, in an ordinary way too? So whenever we hear about Tulpa, we think about ah, this weird big ghost that's there. But don't we have just like little Tulpas in us? Okay, that let's look at that. That we can talk about. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at using Tulpa as a metaphor for kind of psychological uh, integration or, or psychological kind of parts. Absolutely. Although it should be said that apparently tulpas, uh, the tulpa practice was real and the ability to kind of manifest corpse uh, where you would take some of your consciousness and kind of project it into a corpse and that corpse would be manifest. But because it was only an aspect of your consciousness, it would be a bit like a zombie. Like it couldn't like, you couldn't, couldn't play poker with this thing. 
Um, <laughs> but it would kind of follow you around and something could carry your bags and stuff. And it was very utilitarian. Tibet was a big country. You need some dude to carry your bags if you're going to walk like five weeks. But, I mean, that's, that's crazy stuff. But people can Google that. It seems to have... Uh, it seems to have some existence. But yes, let's look at kind of that internal aspect of a split off part. In the lucid dream, absolutely, you can meet uh, personifications of elements of your own psyche. Uh, and that's cool, man. I mean, that's, you can kind of do work like that through shamanic journeying and maybe through some yoga nidra work and through some psychedelic work if you're using it therapeutically. But the cool thing about lucid dreaming is you can actually meet a personification of your fear. You can meet a personification of your sexual trauma. You can meet your greed. You can meet, I mean, I met once the uh, personification of my capacity for violence. And that was crazy, man. And uh, of course, the lucid dream feels as real as this. This is the strange thing about lucid dreaming. And of course, that feeds into the view of the hell realms too. That the lucid dream feels absolutely as real as the waking state. I mean, you can taste, you can touch that, that old thing about pinch yourself to see if you're dreaming. That doesn't work in a lucid dream. You pinch yourself in a lucid dream, you just feel pain. Now that's cool because you're like, pain? but I'm asleep in bed. I'm not really pinching myself. My dream fingers are pinching my dream arm and dream pain is being evoked in my mind. I mean, that's super cool anyway. But so in the lucid dream state, you can kind of meet these split off parts of yourself. You can meet these personifications of your own psyche, which yeah, they manifest like a tulpa. They seem to, to exist, but they don't really. It's form and emptiness. It's, it's, it's not real. It's a projection of your mind, but you can touch it. You can taste it. You can interact with it. So the lucid dream state, yeah, we can meet these aspects of ourselves. And what I'd always ask people to do or, or always advise people to do is to hug them. That could really, the whole teaching I've been doing for the last 11 years could be summed up in that hug everything in your lucid dream. Because if everything in the lucid dream, or at least 99% of everything in the lucid dream is you, then whether it's a manifestation of your anger or your fear or your sexual trauma, hug it. Because what could be more symbolic of, of love, of acceptance, of integration than a hug? So I'd often say hug first, talk later. I love that. Hey, Charlie, would you tell folks your story about entering the hell realm and the hugging? <laughs> okay, there are actually two different ones, but the hell realm I can talk about. And I think actually my uh, Buddhist teacher, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, his book comes out, his biography comes out next month. And I think I get a mention, he says, about one of his students visiting the hell realm through the lucid dream state. So because of this idea that the realms of existence are dreamlike, including this one, it's said that you can use the lucid dream state and the outer body state, which in Tibetan Buddhism is referred to as the special dream body state. You can use those states to visit these hell realms because they don't exist outside of the mind, but then neither does this. You can visit a hell realm as realistically through the lucid dream state as you would if you actually entered a hell realm, right? Apparently. So anyway, I got this instruction to visit a hell realm. Now, I wouldn't advise anyone going to a hell realm unless their Buddhist Lama tells them to. Apart from anything else, you've got no kind of safety backup. I was like, visit the hell room. Will I be all right? And he was like, yes, yes. I'm like, okay, right. So I'm not going to die or go mad or something. So I become lucid. I don't know what, oh no, I was in a car. That was it. I was in a car and I realized no one was driving the car, something like that. And I went, hang on, that's weird. Oh my God, I'm dreaming. So I noticed the weird thing. I became lucid. I'm dreaming, right? And then I remembered the, the dream plan, as we'll call it, from Lama Yeshe, go to a hell realm. So I thought, well, how do you do this? So I don't know. So I just yelled out in the car hell realm now i want to experience the hell realm now and then everything went and it was oh, it's so hard to describe it was complete stuckness imagine the dream pausing like shoop, paused but now imagine that everything that was movement anything that had ever moved did not exist the concept of flexibility or movement or unstuckness did not exist in that state. There had only ever been stuckness in that point in time and then time disappeared. So it was like infinite stuckness. And I can't explain how terrifying the experience of infinite stuckness is. I literally can't explain it, it is beyond words, but it was the most terrifying experience I've ever had because time didn't exist so it would go on forever I would never not be in it. And it was a place where movement didn't exist. And then I panicked and I was like, Whoa, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I tried all the trick in the book and I was just stuck there, stuck there, stuck there for what seemed like an interminable amount of time, probably two seconds, and I woke up. When I spoke to La Mieshe about it, I was like, but I thought the hell realms would be like the Buddhist descriptions were like fire and brimstone and stuff. And he says, hell is in the mind. For you, hell is stuckness. 
And I thought about it and I was like, oh, wow, that is true. I think for many people, hell is stuckness. You know, complete inability to move, a complete being frozen in time, having no agency, having no free will, being stuck in a place of no movement forever was my experience of hell. So yeah, that was a hell realm. Who knows? If you did the same lucid dream plan, and of course you could, it'd be totally different. Like a Christian listening to this, if they called out to go to hell, it would probably be a totally different experience. And whether that would be a good thing to do or an advisable thing to do or not, I don't know. But that was the hell realm one. As far as the hugging the demons thing, it's, oh, I know what I'll tell. I'll tell you one that really crossed the boundary. You'll like this. So I've done a lot of this work where whenever you get lucid, if ever you meet anything scary in the lucid dream, it's you, right? Everything in the lucid dream is you. So you meet something scary, you meet a monster, you meet a vampire, whatever it is, go, a zombie, go and hug them. Show them love because they are an external, they are a personification of some zombified part of yourself or some monstrous part of yourself or some fearful part of yourself, terrifying part of yourself. So you go and hug them, you show them love, and then often they like dissolve into white light or they like turn into a, or you hug them and actually they then you release the embrace and they're not angry. You kind of pacify them. Really obvious psychological work here. So I had this dream about, I don't know, maybe four years ago or something, maybe five. I became lucid. I was at Liverpool Street Station, which is a big station in London. And I looked over the barriers down into the kind of forecourt of the uh, train station. And I saw these people in black robes standing in a circle around a... Uh, Pentacle or pentagram? I always forget but that symbol. The pentacle pentagram. The pentagram, right? And I think, okay, shadow elements, scary stuff. And literally the like, blase. I flew down off the thing, went to them. I thought, okay, they're representations of what? A fear of satanic ritual. Yeah, my Christian upbringing, whatever it is. Okay, it's just shadow stuff. Right? So I see the main one. The main one looked like Charles Dance, who's a character, who's an actor who's been many things, but particularly he, he was in Game of Thrones. People might know him. And he was like main like ringleader of this satanic cult thing. So I just fly over to him, like ground level flying, and I hug him. Uh, and I go, my shadow, and I hug him. And then I felt this incredible force. I mean, it was like being hit by like a sonic boom. And it went boom. And I literally flew off onto the floor. And then he levitated up into the sky, like feet down to the ground. So kind of levitate straight up and went, I am not your shadow. I am the devil. And just for a minute, I was like, oh, she's, I really hope I'm in a lucid dream now and not in an outer body or in some sort of um, thin state where you can cross over through the lucid dream state to other dimensions. I was like, I really hope I'm in a lucid dream. And then I just thought, I thought on my feet, I thought, okay, well, look, whether you're in a lucid dream or the outer body state, if you show this dude fear, if he truly is the devil, which feeds upon fear, you're a goner, mate. So you've got to stay fearless. So I flew up to him and I grabbed him again and I went, there is no devil. There is only energy. And it was so hard to keep my embrace, but I was bear hugging this dude going energy. And then suddenly, boom, he exploded into white light. And then the whole dream exploded into white light. Then I found myself in my bed like, <gasps> I mean, that was a close one, man. I mean, I'm still pretty sure it was a lucid dream and not an out of body, whatever, because of course, what is my shadow? What is my worst fear as a lucid dreaming teacher? My worst fear is that one day I actually will meet the externalized devil. But it turns out love is the most powerful force in the universe. It does not matter whether it is internal or external. If you show the thing fear, you feed it and it will have power over you. If you are fearless and attack it with love, with love, with compassion, that which makes the universe whole, there is nothing to fear. That's totally, that's totally awesome. And it's actually a great kind of lead into this last clip I'm going to play. You've been super generous with your time. Let me cue up this last one. Somebody said to me the other day, do you believe God is evil then? Because I was saying the same thing. I, there's light and dark in all of us. I know evil exists. I've experienced it. But do I have to get stuck in it? Do I have to be identified with it? Do I have to be ruled by it? Do I have to fear it? No, I don't. The way one of my spiritual teachers told me is the secret of the ascent is to always look up. So it's beautiful. what you brought home clearly in your readings and in your work, because you talk about your work with the clients and the people that come see you, is that what if it's about raising the moment that's in front of you and transforming that moment to a higher state? I find that when you look 
at the dark side, it disappears because it no longer holds power over it. Then you can then start to reach up to something more joyful. Some of my darkest moments have led to my most empowered choices. Well, talk about parallels with what you just said, but that is Claire Broad. She has some excellent books. She's been on Richard's show and on my show, and she's a psychic medium there in the UK. Charlie, what did you think? I thought it was great. And um, it reminded me of, it reminded me of the, this idea of our belief systems, right? What Buddha said, he said, with our minds, we make the world. So if that's true, then if I have to choose a belief system, I'm going to choose the one that says, this is a compassionate universe. There is no externalized evil. You are a fully enlightened Buddha who just hasn't woken up to it yet. And our, the, the kind of raison d'etre of our life is to wake up to our inherent wakefulness, to, to wake up to our enlightened nature. Now, I know it's a belief system, but if I have to choose one, I choose that one because that one lets me go to sleep fearlessly. That one lets me see the best in people. That one lets me see the best in others. I'm not saying it's true. It's simply a belief system. But if it's true that with our minds, we make the world, why not choose a belief system that is empowering and that says that we are these fully enlightened Buddhas, that we have this fullest potential within us and that love is the most powerful force in the universe. When I had that lucid dream of the devil, I was very thankful for that belief system. Because if I had not had that belief system, I don't know, man. If I had truly believed that was a devil, I could have woken up with some sort of psychotic break or something. So who knows? But yeah, I totally agree with her that, the, that once you face evil, once you face the shadow again, what is the shadow? It is an epiphenomena caused by an object blocking the light. But the shadow is not the problem here. It's the thing that's blocking the light. Remove the block and there's only light. Maybe evil too is an epiphenomena caused by something blocking our light. It's not that evil has objective existence. It is that is a shadow cast by the blocks in our, in our love. Maybe, I don't know. Richard, any final thoughts before we wrap it up here with our very good friend, Charlie? Yeah, so I'll say something. You, you can quote it if you want, Alex. So, it's little, like, so a couple of curiosities. I actually wonder, Alex, what you make of what Charlie's saying about evil and the shadow and they're not being an external evil given that you're writing a book with the word evil in the title and just to state my own perspective where i'm coming from is that ultimately i think i have the same position as charlie in seeing evil as a manifestation of or what we call evil as a manifestation of trauma and i actually think that we might look back on the 20th century and say like the greatest leap forward in human understanding wasn't the stuff that let us put a man on the moon or anything like that. It was Carl Jung and therapists like Alice Miller who looked at the great dictators and showed how who they were arose out of child abuse and the role that trauma, particularly trauma in early life, affects has an effect on uh, later. To me, the, the precursor doesn't explain the, the act. So the reason I'm drawn to like Tom Zinzer is at least he has a complete theory. Like, I, I really respect what Charlie said there, but I, I, to me, it's somewhat incomplete. It doesn't close the loop. Tom Zinzer does. Tom says, look, there's a force out there. It's darkness. It's like gravity, right? Which is totally consistent with what the Buddhists are saying. It's just there. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not evil. But then there are people that are attracted to the darkness and do evil things. And he even contemplates, and I've heard other of my spiritual teachers say, the reason they're attracted to the darkness is because they have blockages. The light, the love wants to move through them, but they have some scaras, they have other blockages that prevent that. So that then energy gets redirected and often it gets redirected in any way that feels comfortable at the time, either addiction or attraction to things that uh, get that shit out of us in an evil way. But then at that point, they really are doing evil in the way that Charlie defined it. In that That's not are... different to what Charlie said. It doesn't sound different to me. Than Char but, I don't know if you think it's different, Charlie. That well, sounds like... Well, hold on, because I think it's different when we then say that these people are in now engaged, actively engaged in 
doing evil things that prevent the free will of other people being exercised. And then here's the kicker to me that I think everyone kind of likes to gloss over because they're uncomfortable with it, is that in that process of redirecting and misdirecting that energy, they are connecting with energy that is outside of them, that is recharging and energizing that energy. So the reason they do the satanic ritual abuse, like this is my objection, like when I talked to you about the guy, Richard, the inside baseball here, the guy from Ohio State University who says, hell yeah, L. Ron Hubbard and uh, Jack Parsons were in the desert and they were working with Aleister Crowley to bring about the Antichrist. And the Ohio State University professor says, well, whatever people believe, uh, that's what's most important. No, bullshit. What's important first and foremost is, is it possible to direct your energy to beings, entities, real things that are in these extended realm and have them manifest in a way that interacts with this realm? Because if that's real, that is a different reality that we have to deal with. So I don't think that that- Depending on philosophy, right? Because I can connect, let's say I'm connecting with what could be traumatized spirits in some way, like people who have either had a bad life here or a bad life there, or whatever, they're traumatized spirits and they, they want to do harm in the way damaged people here want to do harm. That's not fundamentally different on some level from me connecting with other damaged people here in a cult or something like the Manson right. family and going out to do harm. So it's right. not about whether there's a fundamental evil, it's getting together with, it's traumatized people getting together with other traumatized people. Hold on, if we can't get there to talk about that, then we're lost, right? If we always have to talk about it in metaphor, then we're lost. If we, if we are willing to contemplate the potential reality of that, that just like people can go to a crack house and connect with a bunch of very negative energy and wind up in a worse place, well, that they can connect with the crack house in the spirit realm and wind up with some very dark forces there. As soon as we say, okay, that's on the table, then I'm with you. Let's start that discussion. But right now we have to recognize that we're not having that discussion. Science will not allow us to enter into that realm and religion as we know it will not allow us to contemplate those things. That's the great thing about uh, what Charlie's bringing to the table. He says, hey, I'm part of the spiritual tradition, a long wisdom tradition. And they're, they're not only open to it, but they'll tell you they have a pretty complete explanation of how that stuff might work. Charlie, you're like listening in on an inside yeah, baseball great. conversation. I mean, I, just such a cool conversation. My interviews are not usually like this, man. They usually just tell me about lucid dreaming and stuff. This is brilliant. We're talking about the nature of reality, objective evil, evil and subjective and objective evil and subjective evil. This is brilliant. I mean, yeah, I, I listen to both of you speak. I agree on both counts. I'm like, oh yeah, I really agree with that. I also agree with that. It's like, yeah, I, I, I got anyone who's making like hard and fast claims about this stuff. I think probably need to check themselves, right? But let's at least have conversations about it. Let's at least talk about these possibilities and, and explore it. I mean, what could be more fascinating than this, right? Agreed. Hey, I tell you what, we've used up a lot of your time, Charlie. Tell folks a little bit more about the work that you do with individuals. I know we're in kind of a strange state where workshops are probably not, are, are kind of in flex, but you, you have a perfect way of integrating in the te technology and consulting sessions along with the books. Tell people how they can learn more about what you're up to. Yeah, so I mean, I would advertise a whole world tour I had that finished in the end of November, but who knows whether that's going to happen. It seems like the world tour is going to be right here in the Zoom screen in my living room. But yeah, I've truly embraced that. So I've got like, I've got loads of online courses. I've got like two Lucid Dream online courses. One, oh, the Shadow Work online courses are particularly good, actually. People have been interested in shadow integration stuff. And then I'm now doing a lot of live stuff. So live five-week online courses, doing my first ever Lucid Dreaming retreat through Zoom, where I'll be like waking people up four times a night, just as we would do on the Lucid Dream Retreat. But you'll have like a recording of my voice that you will set. So that's kind of fun, trying to use this technology to, to make this happen. But yeah, everyone can find stuff on my website, charliemorley.com, loads of online stuff and Skype sessions. And oh, I've got this big online, Lucid Dreaming online summit. That's mid-July, you'll find it online uh, when it goes up. Uh, but you can Google it and it's me interviewing like 15 or 20 experts i'm trying to have some really deep conversations about just how far lucid dreaming can go so lucid dreaming online summit you'll find it charlie it's been absolutely fantastic having you on richard thanks so much for being a part of this and helping connect me to charlie so thanks to you both and goodbye
Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Charlie, thanks. Thanks again to Charlie for joining me and Richard for writing Shotgun. The one question I tee up from this interview is what do you make of Charlie's take on entities? That seemed to be kind of one of the central points of this interview. As we enter this dreamscape, are we creating everything? Well, of course we're creating everything. But it seems like when we're really pressed, we come back to this idea that there are these external entities not just in this minute by minute thing we call reality, but somehow beyond that. So that would be the question. Pop on over to the Skeptico Forum if you wouldn't let me know your thoughts or drop me a note and tell me what you think. I got some good ones coming up. I got some not so good ones too, but that's part of the process. Anyways, stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs>